it's um, time to move into our committee meetings. Um, but first, some logistics. And April or Jennifer, do you want to review the logistics for us? Um, certainly. So what we will be doing is after our committee meetings, there will be 15 minutes between all of our presentation sessions. Each session does have a different Zoom link, which you should have received. Panelists have a special link to log in and attendees, you can find that in your email. If you don't have that in your email, please check your spam or you can always refer to uh, our website at conference.loink.org. You must be logged in to see that the private sessions. You can see the free sessions at any time. Participants, attendees um, will use the Q&A feature or raise their hands if you would like to be unmuted. Our committee members need to raise their hands so that they can be elevated to panelists. This will allow you to mute and unmute yourselves. So any committee members that we have on at this moment, please go ahead and click the raise hand button and we will promote you to panelists. For the participants, chat is disabled, so please do use the Q&A function to populate your questions. And during our committee meetings, our committee members, I see hands raising, so thank you for that, um, will be able to turn on your video. You'll be able to mute yourself. And um, if you do have background noise, please make sure that you do respectfully mute um, when you are not speaking. You do not have to share video, that is an option. Do we have any questions about our logistics for our committee meetings? I don't see anything coming in. And we will, as these hands raise, we will elevate you to panelists. And with that, I think we can probably go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, the agendas, again, those are also on the um, conference webpage. So if you need to refer to that, Okay, so uh, this is Marjorie again, and we have, um, we're ready for our combined uh, LOINC committee discussion. We have a number of items uh, to discuss here, and um, <clears throat> I guess we should jump right in and start with Tim Briscoe. Tim, do you have slides? I'll stop sharing. Yes, I do have a, just one sl slide to share. Okay. Okay, um, just want to give a quick update on our development of the new search link tool. Um, as Marjorie uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we did launch the public beta in December, and we received a, a number of a feedback um, on the tool and some improvements and which we have incorporated uh, so far. There's a lot yet to be done. Um, we are anticipating a production release of this new search link tool in June of this year with the, the, the next release of Link. Um, we've listed here some of the features that we're currently working on that we've scoped out for this initial uh, June release. Um, so I, I think this is a, a really good mix of all the critical features um, that most users have requested or things that we have also just you know identified as uh, wishes and wants that we want to put into the tool. Um, we always are looking for your feedback and any kind of feature, re feature requests uh, going forward. Um, this isn't just the initial one and done release. We're continuing to development beyond June. Um, so, you know, please let us know that if there's anything else that you would like to see, any ways we can make this better. Obviously, this is a tool for our community to use to search the link database. So, um, yeah, it really is informed by a lot of the, the work and the suggestions that you bring to us. So um, please continue to use the tool. We recently rolled out translations. Uh, which we're really excited about. Um, so you can all see all the, the available link, um, linguistic variants that we have available. Um, so please continue to use the tool and um, report back with any uh, ideas or issues that you may have. Any questions by chance? I don't see any questions about that. So we can move on to the next agenda item, which is an update on SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 work from Jamie and David. Okay, thanks, April. All right, so um, we've continued to obviously do a lot of work um, for SARS CoV 2 and COVID 19, um, creating the link terms and other resources related to it, um, 
including like the testing, the terms for testing, documentation, reporting continues to take priority. Today, we have over 330 related terms, terms that have been tagged um, and associated with it. And as Marjorie mentioned earlier, over 200 terms um, created for concepts related to laboratory testing, clinical care, and public health reporting. Um, all the SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 terms are created based on user requests. Um, we continue to work closely with APHL, CDC, FDA, labs, IVD manufacturers, and other stakeholders on how best to model these concepts. Um, so the LIVID file that's available on the CDC website um, contains LOINC order and result codes for nearly every assay approved by the FDA under that emergency use authorization. Um, and in the 2.69 release specifically, there were 30 new lab terms, including eight panels. Some of those were multiplex panels. Um, there were several ASCID order entry codes and also new codes for public health reporting related to the World Health Organization's case reporting form, and then also for the CD or the um, public health emergency operations um, reporting. And coming in the June release, so there's several new test codes, but we also will have terms for reporting um, the mutations that are found, like specifically within that spike gene, um, the variant, the lineage, and the clade uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And then we'll also have additional COVID-19 related clinical notes that are used for reporting as well as telehealth, uh, um, additional telehealth codes. These, all of these codes um, are actually available on our pre-release page and then also um, on another web page that I'll show you here in a minute. We have two dedicated web pages. Uh, the first one that's listed includes guidance for mapping to SARS-CoV-2 terms. Um, and then external links to related information, including that livid file that I mentioned. And then the other web page supports downloads of um, the, all the LOINC terms related to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 testing and reporting. That web page is updated daily with any new or edited terms um, and includes lab terms as well as ter the terms related to case reporting, uh, clinical documentation, and ask it order entry. Um, and the, which were created in response to that HHS requirements for SARS-CoV-2 lab result reporting. And then this page contains released and pre-release terms. So I'd like to show you those pages. If you are on our main landing page for loink.org, we have um, direct links to both of those pages here. And so you can go directly, for instance, to the guidance page on mapping your um, codes. It's taken a minute, there it is. So, and then we also, on each of these pages, we give you direct links to go between them. So going to the, the page where you can view all of the LOINC terms associated, as well as there's also a link to a webinar that you can watch if you'd like. So on this page though, we help provide um, a direct link to that livid file that's posted on the CDC website, as well as some kind of information to help on choosing the right code, um, as well as some frequently asked questions are all available here. And then down at the bottom, there's lots of useful links to external web pages related to COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then we have a way to contact us if you have any uh, questions. And then the other page that we have been maintaining um, is all of the is the web page that contains all the terms associated. So in order to download those, you would need to be signed in. Um, so if I log in, I will then have the ability to export down at the bottom. Sorry, I'm scrolling quickly because we have a lot of lab terms. But you can export the data. Um, I believe it says as a CSV file for each of these subsets. So terms related to lab and ask it order entry questions, the convalescent plasma terms, um, and then public health case reporting. And I think finally at the bottom is the telehealth and COVID related uh, clinical note document terms. And as you can see here, we have the release version 
um, when these terms were first released. And then the ones that don't have any um, version first released and are in yellow, um, those are the ones that are pre-released. So they have not yet been included in a release, but are anticipated to be in the 2.70 release. Um, I think that's all related to this. And I was going to hand it over to David to then present Jamie, some. Mm -hmm. we, we do have two questions for you. OK. Um, the first question is, will there be sequencing codes available? There currently are sequencing codes available. Um, so and those have a scale, actually, if I search here. So we have we have various codes for reporting sequencing results. For instance, you know, the accession number, the uh, GISAID sequence accession number. Um, we just created a panel related to whole genome sequencing and identification of that virus. Um, and here you can see the clade term. Uh, there is a very specific code and I'm trying to find it. <laughs> Must be down towards the bottom, but it has a property of sequence right here. This, this term here is the one that would be used to report the whole sequence for that virus. Um, but if there's any terms that are missing here that you're not seeing, we really welcome you to contact us and ask, you know, if you're not able to find something, we're, we'd be glad to help. Great. We have one more question. Uh -huh. um, would like to know more about the settings expected to have the various new COVID notes. I'm this not question's from Pam. So Pam, you can speak if um, you want to clarify or inquire specifically with Jamie about more about that. And I could just comment, you know, our method implies the, the, uh, the specialty. So um, for allergy, immunology, um, telehealth note, I guess we consider these kind of COVID related because they've increased so significantly. Um, in terms of obviously there's a lot of more telehealth medicine happening versus people coming into the clinic. And so we're trying to highlight these terms so that people can use them for mapping um, and find them easily. Um, but then the COVID specific ones, these actually came out of a request from Canada Health InfoWay. So I'm not quite sure how um, in the US everyone is mapping their terms. And this is you know partly all to be worked out as far as interoperability, but for their use case, they needed specific codes to be uh, represent, you know, an immunization note or an evaluation note or a progress note or whatever it might be related to COVID-19 specifically, um, whereas other places may be mapping their um, immunization notes or whatever it might be based on that specialty, specifically defined by that specialty. And so uh, typically, like in all these cases, it's that specialty. It comes out of that specialty is where that note would be used. Pam, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Okay. Any other see, questions, Jen? I don't see any other questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to hand it over to David for now, and I can answer those later. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to just give a little more detail about a few aspects of this. Um, uh, one thing I want to mention ahead of time is that if you can't find a term uh, in the LOINC search, uh, it's still, you know, I know, uh, Jamie, I just want to focus on this a little bit more just in case, you know, anyone has a question. If you go to that SARS-CoV-2 page, you're going to see LOINC terms that haven't, haven't been released yet as well. So if, 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 you're, if a LOINC term has been recently created, you want to go find it there, even if you can't find it in the search. Um, so just focusing on the, uh, a, little, a little bit more about the LIBID file. So what is LIBID? So LIBID is a specification which has been kind of, uh, you know, built up <clears throat> over time as a way of cross-referencing specific in vitro diagnostic tests to LOINC as a standard. And we've been incorporating, of course, uh, for the results and for specimens also SNOMED code <clears throat> into the LIBID file for SARS-CoV-2. So the intention is that as LOINC uh, becomes available, 
<clears throat> then IVD manufacturers or vendors would be able to provide loin codes for their assays. Um, so this livid file for SARS-CoV-2 kind of grew out as, an, as a side effort springing from, from that, you know, sort of more general livid, livid idea. So we've been meeting weekly um, with, you know, a group that discusses coding for all the new SARS-CoV-2 related um, submissions to the FDA for emergency use authorization. And in these weekly meetings, we basically go over all the new um, submissions for that week. Uh, we review issues related to, you know, whether a new loin code is needed or a new SNOMED code is needed for a result or a new strain. Um, and all these codes are placed into this file, which is then published weekly on the CDC website. And you can see the link here. Um, and I wanna to go to that link just so we can take a closer look at that file. But just you know, a few things to keep in mind is that, you know, all of this is updated weekly and contains all the EUAs submitted to the FDA. It's really only tests approved in the US. Um, there are a number of tests that are developed and produced by international manufacturers that are also on this list, but it really does focus on US approvals. But what it, what it does is it provides a listing of basically all the assays uh, by manufacturer and specific kit and match them to codes. And I wanna take a closer look at that file um, just so you see. So if you click on this link, you basically get to this web page. And then if you click on this link within that web page, livid SARS CoV-2 test codes dot XLSX, you get a file that looks like this. So basically this file will map say a manufacturer and a model to a loin code for the result and a loin code for the order. What you'll also find in this file are is a mapping to SNOMED codes for all the um, results, result answers, and also for all the specimen types. So it's kind of a nice file that tells you if you're using this kit by this manufacturer, here's your code. So it's a, it's a great way of, of enhancing interoperability by making sure that everyone has a basically central access to the same set of codes for that specific kit. Okay, and let me try to go back. So we've already seen the actual file. Um, I wanna go, I didn't mean to change slides. So last week's published file had 645 rows. So that's a lot of rows. Um, it's a lot of test kits, but it doesn't represent a one-to-one -one mapping for kit. So just to kind of uh, give you a sense, those 645 rows that are in this file um, map to actually 331 unique assays. So some of these rows are duplicated because they can be run on different instruments. And, you know, while, while we're here, let me just go back there quickly and show you those rows in that file. So if you scroll to the right, you see here again, the manufacturer and let me find one that has multiple rows and see if we can get, uh, maybe this one will tell. So if we scroll to the right, we can go to the column that's called vendor equipment um, UID. And you can see that these two rows, although they're the same for manufacturer and kit, and they of course will have the same loin codes because of that, they actually are um, can be run on two different pieces of equipment, and that's why they have two rows in this file. Okay, so now just to talk a little bit about the SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 groups that Loink has built, there are basically right now three groups for the lab terms. 
there's the group code is here. And if you click on the group code, that basically give you um, the LOINC details page for that group. Um, so there's one group for all LOINC terms related to detection of the virus, basically by any method. So direct detection of the virus by molecular antigen or culture. Um, the uh, LOINC group, uh, the next LOINC group we have is all the LOINC terms for just molecular detection. And then there's a LOINC group for all LOINC terms for the SARS-CoV-2 serological testing for antibodies to the test, to, to the uh, virus. So let's look at one of these. Okay, so basically this is the group for all viral detection, direct viral detection, and you get the whole list. Um, Um, and these two will give you similar lists. There's also a value set for terms related to COVID-19 and uh, for case reporting purposes. Um, and if you go, and these groups are also available from the link fire terminology server. So if you go to the fire terminology services uh, page, you can scroll down and look for public health codes. Where is this? So if you scroll down, you see public health value sets here. And these give you the links to access those value sets by fire. So basically if you hit this group on, in the fire server, um, and I'll just show this one example, it returns you the, uh, <laughs> the formatted structured fire result for those same value sets that we described before. So there's multiple ways to get at the information. Um, it's, it's all in there and um, uh, that's really all I have to say. So I guess we can move on. Thank you. There, David, there's actually a question that um, Pam has offered to answer live. And the question sure. is, do vendors publish non-SARS-CoV-2 link codes in a central location? Pam? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to let the public know that the LIVID file has been around for about four years now um, from ivdconnectivity.org and the major vendors had worked together to publish those, uh, that standard. And individually, you could go out to Abbott, Biomiru, Roche, Siemens and get their LIVID template. Um, but it's not in a central location like the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 livid file, which crosses all manufacturers. You would need to go to each individual uh, manufacturer. I hope that helps her. One thing that we encountered during the uh, process of reviewing uh, codes and <clears throat> package inserts uh, as part of producing a livid file is we've actually encountered manufacturers that have started to include LOINC codes actually in their package insert, um, which is an interesting step and I think would, would probably go a long way towards uh, helping in uh, use of LOINC in the long term. Are we ready to move on to the next item? I think it's uh, Jamie Deckard and Dr. Stan Huff. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Stan, do you have audio now? I do. Oh, great. All right. <laughs> I think um, we're going to talk about the fire data type human name and its elements um, and the, the request that we received to create link codes for those. And Stan, do you want me to display or do you want to talk first a little bit about that and the request? Uh, yeah, I can, yeah, if you could display and I'll, I'll kind of talk. I'd, sure. Uh, so <clears throat> our particular interest in, in adding a human name and actually the human name parts, first name, last name, uh, <clears throat> comes from the work that we're doing to create logical models for clinical information 
and then those models, uh, you, you know, we we adhere to a formalism uh, and and try and make them consistent, and then we can, from those logical models, we can translate to fire profile, you know, fire resources and 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 profiles on those fire resources, uh, and we can do that for. Uh, translate those same structures and content to version two of HL7 or to DICOM or to NCPDP, et cetera. And the, what we're trying to do is, is enable um, what we think is a better uh, representation of, of names. And by that, what we've done you know, uh, so far in LOINC is uh, for, th for places where it was needed for, for instance, the, the NACER uh, registry submission standard, we've made codes that say, you know, patient first name, patient last name, or uh, other, other examples like that, where the, <clears throat> the, the kind of person, if you will, whether you're a patient or uh, a provider, et cetera, is pre-coordinated in the name. But what we would like and, and, and is I think more powerful is to make human name, <clears throat> uh, which, which doesn't include, you know, whether it's a patient name or another name, uh, you know, or a contact person or uh, the messenger, whatever it is, it doesn't include that because <clears throat> in the structure of of the of the information, uh, for instance, you would have a patient object, and then within that object, you would just have name and uh, you know last name, first name, etc. That's more powerful because uh, you now have the same the same code to identify a last name, whether it's uh, you know, part of a person, part of a provider, part of some, and, and you can reuse that structure and reason about the name or, or you know, provide special logic for the name, and it will apply to all names without having to say, uh, do this for patient name, do this for provider name, do this for uh, the, the reporting uh, organ, you know, the, the lab uh, supervisor, et cetera. And the a secondary benefit of this is one of the one of the challenges that you have the way that uh, most of the standards have been created with DICOM and NCBTP and Fire and HL7 version two is you know the names are part of a fixed structure and and so when you for instance, if you're trying to create consistency between HL7, uh, FHIR, and version two, and other things, uh, DICOM and uh, NCPDP, all of those, there's no semantic identifier that's attached to those. You basically have to go, uh, you're just working from the standard itself where that structure is defined. And so this would provide uh, semantic identifiers for those kind of uh, crosswalks so that you have a consistent semantic behind those names. So that's my, my quick introduction. Um, and, you know, uh, I'll let uh, Jamie uh, say more. Uh, I think there's some, well, one concern that we have, this is going back historically, when uh, when we first created uh, the, the, the codes that are in LOINC now for patient name and, you know, patient first name, patient last name, et cetera, those, those were made specifically for NACER in their uh, transmission of data to data registries. And in the NACER standard, it's 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 totally a, a name value pair for everything in the standard. So there are no fixed, you know, uh, fixed position fields in that standard. Everything has everything has a code and then a value for the code. 
Um, we were worried at that time that if we made these names, people would misuse them uh, and use use those codes in place of uh, where the name should have been, for instance, in in the version two HL7 standard or where it should be in fire or where where it's a physical part of the structure. Mm -hmm. And as I thought about that more though, I, I mean it's really it's really not a um, th there's no real chance that you can substitute these loink codes for the name in in the structure because if you don't fill in the name in the structure then the message is not valid so you can't you know you you couldn't just like make uh you know an extension to a help to a fire profile and put patient name in a different place uh because patient name has to be in a in a particular place, you know, as, as specified in the in the fire resource, and if it's not there, it's not a valid message. So um, I, I think there's it it doesn't create a challenge, but it we probably should uh, if we create these names, you know, put as part of the description or the definition the purpose of these, so that people understand the difference about when these codes would be used in logical models or in forms or um, in cross mapping across across standards uh, and you know the relationship of that purpose and use to uh, the structural named elements in in the standards so i'll stop there and and let jamie uh, facilitate additional discussion yeah, and thank you, Stan. That that gets kind of to the heart of our um, reasoning why we wanted to bring it to the committees um, to discuss because um, because of that confusion, we wanted to avoid that, um, and we wanted to really understand like what would be the use case, and is this really a link linkable or something we should create in link, um, and so. Uh, just some background, we can go to the actual fire web page for this if we'd like. Um, the data type uh, currently aligns with the human name data type currently aligns with our person name um, property that we have in the link. Um, we stand uh, wonderfully covered kind of all the past discussion we had between uh, Susan Matney and Stan and then also Ted Klein related to us trying to better understand the use case for needing these link codes. Um, and I think to, to kind of summarize, they need it in the data model, the logical data model, um, in order to represent the use for that name, the family name, given name, and so on. Um, but that is agno agnostic or not tied to a contact, tied to a patient, tied to an animal, <laughs> tied to whatever it might be, but that it's just um, doesn't indicate, you know, what that what the relationship is since it's used across resources and fire. Um, and our general question was, how is this being used clinically? Um, and our understanding is that it would not be used. It would not be, you know, it, it, it would only be used in the, the data models. Um, and so just, I'll jump down to some of our key, uh, or some of our general questions or comments is that our understanding is that we've never really created codes that would just be used for modeling um, and that would not be used for clinical data exchange, at least that we are aware of. I mean, it's quite possible with our current team that we're not aware of the use for this um, in the past. And then, We've never created codes to represent just data types. Um, the data type generally corresponds to just one axis, like we had talked about the PN for property. Um, and then we also wondered whether this was a better fit for SNOMED uh, codes or link parts um, instead, since it kind of is more of a one-to-one -to -one to, with that versus um, being associated with an observation about a patient. Um, and so, he, as Stan mentioned, we have a lot of these existing codes already in LOINC for name, patient name, contact name, mother's name, you know, on and on. 
And those were created as part of um, like forms, assessments, uh, uh, registries, reporting, um, where there wasn't necessarily a, a way to send that information in the structured message. Um, and whenever we've created those, we've tried to highlight what the HL7 in V2 at least, where it would go, like in the PID segment, ideally. If you're able to send it in the PID segment, this is where you could send it. Um, we haven't actively maintained that field, but we try to provide that information if needed. Um, the human name one, we weren't quite sure about in general or just, just name because um, we couldn't quite understand clinically how it was going to be used if you know, it, if it didn't identify this is the patient's name or this is the mother's name um, in that medical record for clinical data exchange. And so, uh, and these, these are just the proposals that we were thinking about and um, we think this is a great discussion. So um, we're, our current recommendation would be to use the part codes or the SNOMED CT codes. Um, if we create the requested terms, it seems we would need to release them as deprecated or discouraged since they're not intended for use in messaging of patient data for the reasons that um, Stan, you had highlighted. And then any other suggestions? Jamie, we do have a few people that have their hands raised. Yes, um, okay. Ted, Dan, and Rob, you are welcome to unmute yourself and speak. I'm gonna have Ted go first because he's okay. at the top of mine. <laughs> Good pick. <laughs> but Ted, I'm only gonna give you five minutes. So. Yeah, please, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, so I encourage the use of, of parts because in many ways, um, th these can be thought of um, as really metadata identifiers for um, uh, parts of uh, data type objects in other standards that are then used in support for mapping, expert systems, reasoning. Um, uh, absolutely, they would not and should not be used for observation reporting. Um, and we do need to document it as such, but the same way you wouldn't, you wouldn't be sending one of the document ontology um, uh, uh, access code values um, as part of a patient observation in any way. All right. uh, Dan, you're next up on my screen. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'm going to side with Stan on this one. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to, and I'm going to speak in favor of a use case, um, which is in, in fire related to questionnaires. So I don't, we, I might, I don't, I can't think of at this moment, a form that has this exact structure, but that I think is almost irrelevant where basically you have a structure for capturing a name and then some other attribute, you say what that person is for, whether it's the mother, the aunt, the, you know, so forth or the provider. Um, but in the context of form capture, it's really nice to be able to build that entire structure with LOINC observation codes as the identifiers. Now that's not the, the final resting place for that information. And the structured data capture standard provides some techniques for transforming a questionnaire response, which is the whole package of stuff into the sort of preferred or ideal native structures, which would in this case be transforming that into, you know, um, a, a patient or, or some other, you know, person record. So that data would go somewhere else. But for the purpose of capturing that entire form, rendering it with tools like, you know, uh, NLM's form widget, building that from a link panel structure, I think this would be super helpful. And I think all the caveats, you know, described about saying what it's for and not and for um, and what it's not for is 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 quite important. But I think for that purpose, it would be hugely valuable. And I think in that context, observation codes as opposed to part codes, because in the context of a questionnaire, you're assigning a value. And in general, we've not, you know, tried to promote the use of a of a link part in a case where you would actually be storing data. So anyway, um, I'll, I'll go with Stan's recommendation on this one. So you're, you're kind of saying that it could be used for clinical report, you know, for reporting. They would be sure. potentially used. I don't see used. why not. I mean, so we have these examples where people have pre-coordinated all kinds of sort of special um, relationships or roles that, mm -hmm. I, that you're trying to capture the name for, mm -hmm. but I don't, 
given how fire is structured now, I don't see why you wouldn't have some, some other form, you know, at some point down the road, maybe it exists, we just haven't linked it yet, where mm -hmm. that role is captured as a separate element. And yeah, that's so it's kind of like our XXX system or in lab exactly. where we don't say what it is, it's provided elsewhere. Exactly. Um, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, John Snyder, I have, oh wait, well, I might have skipped Rob. Rob, yeah, Rob McClure. <laughs> okay, Rob, Rob, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, let me un unmute, un video, or end video. Uh, so first off, I have to actually give a shout out to Marjorie for uh, referencing Biggie in her introduction. I think that was an awesome thing. So um, <laughs> you, you get a, a big thumbs up for that. Um, the uh, I'm I'm also totally on board with what we just heard. Um, I put this into our chat, but and for those folks who are going to attend the well, actually, the present the the presentations and then the document ontology. We're going to talk a little bit about the Gender Harmony Project, and one of the things that project has identified the group that is doing that has really pushed for is the importance of having what we were calling um, a preferred name, which aligns based on conversations that we've had already with the fire approach towards um, in the the fire panel, or sorry, the the human name data type and use of usual. And um, just like what was just discussed, I think there's, you know, not that this is as slippery a slope, I think, as perhaps people might can be concerned about. There's a lot of value in having in loinkifying things that cut across many models. And, and so uh, the ability to make sure that, and these are captured everywhere, I think this aligns with the uh, USAT uh, project. There's a lot of reasons why the sort of things that are identified here would, you know, just the fact that there's a model that has a field name that aligns with this doesn't mean that we can't use this as a way of making sure that wherever these, this information is captured, it could have a lonkified identifier. I also agree that these are observations. And so I'd rather see them you know, kind of full class objects like that. So um, just, you know, throwing my weight behind the approach that Stan and, and Dan just kind of highlighted. Great, thank you, Rob. Uh, John, did you still have something to add? Yeah, uh, okay. I just want to add, I, I completely agree with the discussion so far. I think this is a, a great model. The one question I have may be a little bit deeper in the weeds than we want to go in this discussion, but with the human name use, is the terminology binding is to an extensional HL7 value set. Is that something that would be considered to maybe be changed to an intentional value set of SNOMED codes to make this more flexible over time? So you're referring to the codes correct here yes and if i click on this does this take it i yeah, think if I'd... you click on use there you go and if you scroll down so you'll see here it is an, a, an extensional value set based on hl7 but uh from a flexibility standpoint to meet like the gender harmony project and other projects that are going on would this be better served to be an intentional value set definition as opposed to an extensional as it is now. It's a good question. I don't think I can answer that. Well, I, I think it would be. I, I don't want to tangle that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I agree that would be a good thing, John, but I don't want to tangle that with the question about making the loin codes for the name parts. And I think within LOINC, if we had a use code, if we don't have something currently already, we could map, you know, these result values to SNOMED codes if there is one that exists. So we could provide that to users if, but yeah, and, and I don't know if that yeah. would be the ideal approach, but. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I guess I had one other comment. I don't know if anybody else has. So if we, um, if this happens for human name and maybe, you know, and, and it sounds like it's something we definitely should do. Where do we stop then? I mean, we've got address that's used across resources. We've I, got, I, I, if you I, just I continue on. Stop. I would not stop. Don't, I, oh, I, don't I, stop. I want, I want, I want semantically meaningful codes for every single bit of information that we're transmitting. 
Okay. And it, and again, it, it, you know, I, the, the, the thing is, I mean, they're, they're, you know, signed up kind of lots of these things in a sense, but lots in the terms of, of maybe over time, we would get to 200 or 300 codes when we've got a hundred thousand codes, you know, for other stuff. So these, these kind of, if you will, sort of structural codes uh, are not endless uh, mm -hmm. there, but, but, but there would be more, but we're not asking you to make them all right now. We'll, we'll come back and bother you another day. <laughs> for well, and, the, and then I guess another question is, and maybe this isn't anything we can answer, but as the content team, you know, we receive these requests from CDC, um, CMS, I mean, it's endless as far as with the forms to represent, you know, this information that's on the forms and to distinguish between a contact or a patient or a mother or a father or, and how are we, yeah, I guess we, it's like anything, you know, you have the competing models and eventually one of them will win. <laughs> and then that'll help our, us try to guide the, you know, the users into remodel or changing their structure of how they're reporting. Exactly. That, that's what you would want to do is you'd like to, you, you know, when they ask for those say, you know, we know what we, we know what you want. Uh, this, you know, this, this more flexible structure that allows you to have a patient name and then say, you know, what kind of, you know, who's either contain it in, in another patient means that you don't have to make uh, you know, it taking this to the absurd, you know, you don't have to make uh, the CMS's patient first name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you, you say just, you know, uh, you can say, you can say in there, this is, is, this, is, is, is a person's name, you know, the patient's name or the contact patient's name or the reporting person's name or the, you know, uh, and you can do that essentially as a post coordination or by by inheritance from from uh, an encapsulating type, so that you know the context exactly of what this means. But you you, you sort of you, you don't have to proliferate codes to do that same thing. Now I don't know that it'll prevent it from happening anyway. But uh, and so this is Susan Jamie. Hi Susan. Uh Hi. Uh, <laughs> if you look up above, you've got the name Ty. I mean, we started, as we started converting our models and making sure we were encoded, we started having all these different name types. And I think we for sure want that because, you know, you're going to have your, who you were exposed to name and all of the different types of, of, of names. And as far as the address and stuff goes, I'm happy because we're going through our models and optimizing them and making sure they're totally coded. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to submit um, things if you want me to. You're going to keep us busy, huh? <laughs> uh, I, I'm never going to stop. So. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Well, I, I actually, since this is something we will process then soon, or maybe I should take a vote or we need to take a vote on um, how everyone in general feels about creating link codes for this. If there's any objections, um, I'm not quite sure how to run that. <laughs> so what I think we should do, Jamie, is mm -hmm. um, for all of our panelists that are committee members and for those of you that are still attendees that would like to jump over as a panelist that you haven't let us know about, we'll just do a quick raise your hands. Um, and I, I think the question is, are we creating um, the human name codes as yeah, you the described? That would be, that's the first so question. This, and after that, I'd like to talk about yeah, I'll, like, I'll make a potentially the model. I'll motion that we make the LOINC observation codes for the, what's on the screen, first name, last name, name, prefix, all of the others, and as needed address, so we don't have to motion again. Um, you, all of that's, I'll make a motion that we accept those as LOINC terms. So this human name panel at the top there. Yeah, I, I think the one other thing we would need to add to this is the, so, or the, um, who the subject is. In this, this here doesn't, provide within the panel the subject or maybe that information's outside of the panel 
it could be both ways. And so mm -hmm. I, uh, depends on the model. So it can yeah. be an optional item within the panel. I, I think an optional and that way you can use the same panel inside of and you know ha have basically the subject would be inherited by where it's contained or uh, you could you could put it inside which I think would be more convenient in some cases as well. So is a subject and a role and so they can be kind well, of multiple it, it, containers. It gets a, let's let's think about that some more before we decide to throw it in there. Yeah, well, that's why I'm very hesitant about the slippery slope this could turn into. Yeah. So this is this is Margie. Let me interject. So um, it was Sue. Susan just put a motion, motion. on the floor, <laughs> but it sounds like there's a revision to the motion. So if we're going to follow Robert's rules, right? So maybe we withdraw the motion and talk some more. Um, April, I would ask, we're, do we we're, have... We're not we're not that formal, Marjorie. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're, so if, we get in, if, we, if we get in trouble, we fall back to that. But as long as everybody's <laughs> agreeing, I think we're okay. Everybody well, agrees it's unanimous consent kind of thing. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I wasn't clear on what we're putting on the floor since, uh, you know, there have been some, Ted introduced some other thoughts. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Let's clarify exactly what we're voting on. Yeah. Um, so, so it would yeah. be the addition of those things, and I would take the question mark off of subject. Okay. And we can discuss another day. Uh, I think, I think, if we're going to talk about roles, then I think we need to we have need to have more discussion. Uh, but I think we're safe with what we've got right. there on the screen now. Okay. This, this is probably a good minimum. I would support this. Okay, so let's have everybody then um, do a quick raise hands. If you could do that for me and we will take a consensus of where we land. And if there are any strong objections, now would be the time to put those out. Um, I see, yeah, I see Cindalyn is, um, are you, is she a panelist? Yes, raising is, um, we agree on this. We are supporting this vote and we still have some more attendees that need to be promoted okay let's yeah just this this is an aside uh one yeah, we've of, got one some of the more things... coming in to vote <laughs> go ahead yeah um you know we've tended to think about when when you talk about people uh, and 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 for instance the person resource within fire etc we we think about the things that we put in there as being special like birth date and first name and last name and uh, you know any any other kind of uh, of kind of information and we think of them as sort of immutable and and different but but in point of fact they're they're truly like observations in other any other sense. I mean, we only know them because somebody observed them, or they told us about it, or they, you know, and and they can be collected by different people, and they can have discrepancies between what person you know what one person thinks their name is and a different person, and 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 we only know we were there, but we can't tell you from personal experience what our birth date was. So those things in every sense are like other observations. Now, what makes them special with, with patient is that, you know, our, our, our common use case is that we want, to, we want to take things that we know and be, be able to find that person in a database or something. And so the, the set of things that you want to, to be in that lookup index table you know, is sort of dictated by how useful those data elements are in in finding a unique, you know, making a unique match to that person. Uh, but you, you know, you get into slippery slope, you see a lot of things that are going into patient like, you know, past military service or a bunch of other things that are again, obviously just observations and have no no reason to be in the patient, you know, index file. But anyway, that's, that's a rabbit hole that we don't need to go down today, but um, 
There are a couple of questions that mm -hmm. I want to ask that came into the chat. One is from Andrea is, um, I'm sorry, how are folks with a single name represented? Good question. Given name maybe? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, you, we just have to make a convention. Uh, and I, I don't know. Okay. That's something that you should, should take back to, I, I think that's a question for HL7. Uh, you know, what's, what's the proper representation for somebody with just one name? Okay. Uh, and then uh, speaking of HL7, the next question is from Axel, wondering how you consider existing HL7 extension for typing the prefix, for instance. So I didn't understand the question. I, it says, wondering how you consider existing HL7 extension for typing the prefix. And Axel, I believe you can unmute if you would like to um, clarify your question. Yeah, sure. I uh, was searching the button, not using Zoom that often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the current design of uh, that data type in Fire has flaws because like the prefix is a very good example uh, because prefix can be any, so can be academic title, but also like um, uh, the font and so on. So, and so uh, there are in fire extensions existing with further qualify what type of prefix is like an academic title or any other type. So I was wondering if you just uh, don't consider that um, how meaningful an information uh, stories. So how is it an extension? Is it a, a separate element in the, or, or is it a, an extension on prefix itself? Um, in, in that case, this extension is specifically to relate it to prefix, but there are too many other uh, parts. Um, uh, extension existing just need to uh, give you the correct name in a moment to pull this out um, so and if you go to the hs7 specification for patient click on profiles and extensions on the top you find it and i'm looking for the patient oh here we go um, there is um, as an extension on the data type. Sorry about this one. Um, so it's human name extension. So um, I, I, this is Susan. We might need to have something like prefix type, which isn't a bad idea. A suffix type too, for that matter. And um, that's and something relates back to ISO 21090. So, which has further qualification to that. Maybe let me try. Yes, that's the ISO through. data type specification derived from the version three data types in HL7. Oh, yeah. did, so, did we find the actual the extension yet? Well, I just put in our chat the link to the extensions on human name. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I was wondering what your thoughts were on this too, Rob. Oh, perfect. So actually my thoughts are that we're not ready to make a decision yet. <laughs> <laughs> I would, yeah. I would uh, always That's support this uh, point of view because if you start to think about then uh, complexity grows is my impression. And Yeah, I, I, I absolutely think we should do this. I just think that we haven't probably investigated particularly the international um, implications of what we might try and do. I think we need to do it right. And, um, and so we're probably not quite ready to do it right. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of other comments and maybe questions that um, probably support the let's take a pause on this. Yeah, um, um, if, if I could, I, I think um, Rob makes a great point. And I'm wondering, April, how are we doing on time? Um, we are at 1040 and we 
are still at where we um yeah we are we are should have just now started so we are still very well ahead <laughs> but I'm, I'm just wondering i mean we could this is a great discussion and um we could drain it a lot further i'm wondering if we should bring this one to a close in the next few minutes and then table this for a very substantive discussion at the next committee meeting like clinical yeah well, I, I, yeah I, yeah, I think we should table it. I, I, I'm in favor of it, by the way, mm -hmm. but I think actually the discussion should happen at HL7, not here. And there needs okay. to be uh, some more analysis. <laughs> okay. Okay, so as we sort of um, conclude that, I do want to add that uh, Rita had, Rita Pyle, not our Rita, has a comment that single family, single names go into family in most implementations. And then also a question um, that um, obviously as we delve into this further, we'll consider that. So the fire spec needs to be changed to implement these link codes, which we will take that question as we further discuss this, unless there is a quick response. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, wait, hang on. Oh, we, sorry. We, we all voted, we all voted to go ahead yeah. and add that. Right? Okay. Sorry, the additional I misunderstood. questions are the only things that are that are up in the air. Is okay. Jamie, is that you typing? Yes, it is. Okay. I yeah. put okay. it right back. <laughs> okay. I misunderstood. I thought we weren't quite sure. No, we, we, no, we, 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 we just said they're, they're, they, we agree with the extensions, we, but, but those things need to be, uh, and, you know, they're, they're the questions of extensions to prefix, et cetera, for kind of prefix and also uh, discussion that should happen around roles and the relationship of roles to these kind of names, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but those those should be discussions generally at at HL seven, because there you have not not just us terminology nerdy people, but a lot of clinical people who will have opinions and thoughts about that. Yeah, Stan, this okay. I agree with that. Um, I I do think it should happen at HL seven, but then we would circle back and bring that back to the right absolutely yeah so, back yeah. to the clinical committee or yeah exactly. this clinical or lab i'm not sure where this falls but um yeah uh, i i think we should do that and when is the next hl7 meeting that where we would bring this forward it uh it it's in may okay all right may may is may is the working group meeting of course anything urgent can be brought up to um, any of the specific work groups as a request for discussion. Okay, so we'll need to make sure that we get this on the agenda at the appropriate committee meeting at HL7. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and just, just so we know, so this, this because we're talking about a data type, we're talking, uh, the, the group that officially owns this is FireEye, um, and so, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we need to kind of plan our interaction with them to, to kind of figure out who has the most uh, kind of knowledge about how this is being played out. Right, agree. I agree with that. So, Jamie, do you have what you need to... Um, Not necessarily. I have one additional question, and that okay. surrounds like the modeling of the term in LOINC, and we... Another thing we weren't quite comfortable with was human, um, just because we have lots of veterinary codes. Patients in LOINC are both animals and humans. And um, our understanding in FIRE is that they consider an animal name associated with the same um, data type because humans are the ones that name their animals. Um, but- okay, I, Jamie, Susan, we, we'd be fine calling them person. Person. Or something like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. As far as the general subject, that's okay. I, I think that's. I think that's a better. I like. I like person better than human. Um, yeah, I, I. I agree because there are there are named named objects that share some characteristics, but some are widely divergent. For non-person uh, observation subjects. Okay. Great. That was my only other question that I had. Okay, but I also met Jamie. You know, we'll have to. So you've got your your modeling advice mm -hmm. to a point, right? And then 
we'll need to think about um, sort of making sure this remains on the agenda with the committee. That, that's a different discussion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think we're taking separate notes as well. So yes, I don't think these are a primary, but yeah, yeah. No, I yeah. just wanted to type out for everyone to see. Yep. No, I think that's great. So are, is there any, Jamie, are you, um, you have what you need and is this the end of the agenda item or should yes. we? Because we're still- Unless Stan here. has any other comments. <laughs> right. No, I'll, I'll shut up. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> no, no, we really appreciate the- Yeah, Thanks. this is great. Thank Thanks you. So much. Yeah. Um, I think the next um, item is mapping certification and Pam, is that, am I following it correctly? Yes. That's what I understand too, Marjorie. Let me share my screen. So I'm just kind of bringing this up as a brainstorming moment. Um, as people in the audience may be aware, there's, it's taking longer to adopt LOINC than we had ever in, anticipated. And there's been various uh, criticisms published on LOINC mapping errors. Um, and I was just trying to think of how we might be able to bolster or encourage people who have been assigned or are undertaking a project to do LOINC mapping. So I'm raising up a question that was asked, I think in the, in the mid 2000s and um, about what about having um, a certification process for LOINC mappers. And just wondering if it's time to uh, recycle this around. I don't have any presumptions or constraints to anything. Um, the floor will be open and I don't know if we want to do hand raises to um, take the floor. You know, um, Pam, before you do that, I'm wondering if you could give us maybe some more background on the criticism, maybe the types of criticism, you know, if you could do that. I could try. Um, within within an organization, you know, we don't know how many people are involved in doing reviews uh, that would be right on the that point. But there has been kind of some third party uh, observations that have taken place in the last couple of years, where um, there was an examination, for example, from uh, the CAP surveys. And there was an examination of um, some cardiac markers and how the local labs that were participating in the proficiency testing of the laboratory test had coded um, their LOINCs. And there was some comparisons uh, made and um, there wasn't a lot of return of the surveys back from like not all people that participated in the proficiency test, which is the required element uh, for having your CLIA certification, but it was kind of a sidebar about having the LOINC done on it. Um, I know that within the committee, if we're ever perusing each other's catalogs, if we find something that's up, we just send a gentle email and ask a little bit more information um, from the issuer of a LOINC code. But I'm just um, trying to throw it out there and see if we can take any sort of a proactive approach going forward that um, the people that are doing the mapping have had some um, some training and have uh, an understanding of of what they're what they're doing. So, so this, uh, this is Susan. Um, you know, I I'm certified um, a SNOMED CT um, author, and it gives you some credibility to be able to say that, but it requires a lot you know, the education first. And, and so there needs to be a big education component. You know, uh, what are the, the LOINC axes? How do you map to them? What does that mean? What is, and exercises. And so, so, I mean, just throwing out a test and saying I'm certified. I mean, I could probably wing that and pass, but, but I think there needs to be some thought in what is the knowledge required to be certified and how do we get that to our users? Really good input. And I, I agree entirely. Um, when the microbiology mapping guide was created and the draft of the quick share 
or the, the quick start guide, there were, you know, questions that are sitting in the back. It's, they're just in, it's an informal process, of course, at that point. But I, I agree that there couldn't be a, a certification without a curriculum. Yeah. And we do have some hands raised. I want to make sure, um, and some questions. So, uh, Dan, Daniel, if you want to go first with your question or comment. Not a, not a question, a comment. <laughs> um, I think it's a great idea. Um, it's been a good idea for a long time. I can share um, with the current one team, they, they might be able to dig it up probably from the archives, a proposal I wrote in 2014 for funding this exact thing. It didn't get funded. Um, but my point is it, it takes a pretty significant investment um, to set it up. But I think the value to the community is huge. Um, the point about having a kind of a, a standardized curriculum is really important. Um, there are a lot of great examples for us to build on, um, both within sort of our immediate circle, SNOMED and HL7, for example, has long had um, certification testing as part of their sort of portfolio of things. Um, but outside too, you know, from, you know, Linux Foundation and other, you know, technology um, uh, efforts have similar things. So um, I, I think it's a really good idea, both from a, um, uh, the, the value proposition you raised, uh, Pam, in, in terms of helping kind of raise the bar on uh, that and demonstrating competence, but also raising awareness um, and promoting, you know, more widespread education in kind of a step-by-step -step fashion, all of which I think are fantastic. Um, the, uh, the key is that it's going to take Reagan Street um, a pretty significant set of um, uh, resources to, uh, to get up and going. Um, but uh, I wholeheartedly support the, the, the idea. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, is there another question? Yeah, we have several hands raised and several questions. <laughs> so, okay. um, Andrea? Yeah, yeah I, I would support it as well, um, echoing what Dan said and also um, Susan and Pam um, on things. The, the thing from a lab perspective that we've talked about just historically from previous meetings for those who may not have attended is that there's different philosophies on generic link codes to promote grouping and, um, you know, but then more specific link codes and typically from the lab side, um, the recommendation is to specific link codes so you don't lose that data that might be needed downstream, but you can certainly group and do things downstream. So. A lot of it might be dependent on different use cases or where the data lie, what type of information system, the source or downstream entity. And I saw someone um, mention too, like differences between clinical lab notes, ontology. So I think it would be good to maybe have focus areas of mapping. Um, and I think it's also good because you learn a lot more as things and functionality um, evolves. I mean, some people may not have read the link guide or the updated Link guides and manuals to know some of the features and um, things to help with mapping. But then those of us who have been mapping for a number of years um, out there, I think it'd be good from an expertise to show, hey, you know, um, this is kind of um, some of the competencies that have been um, achieved. And it might also help from a global more um, informatics um, competency perspective, but just a few thoughts there. Um, one other thing is when I was on the CD, um, CDC ONC funded lab interoperability cooperative, which was a sister grant that Ricky had with the public health agencies, we worked with um, over 1200 hospital labs on their link mapping when the meaningful use came out. Um, and to Dr. Tripathi's point this morning was there is no link police, um, but the laboratory, because they were so highly regulated, regulated they're asking, you know, is there a link place? What happens if we have incorrect link codes? And it's so vital with all the downstream impacts that we talked about that we get correct maps and quality maps because especially from a patient safety perspective. So just some food for thought, this would be very helpful in that regard. Great, thank you. Um, I do have two attendees that I'm gonna allow to talk, uh, Tawny. You have your hand raised and you're allowed to talk if you want to unmute. Thank you. Uh, so I am a longtime linker and I'm working at Ascension right now with uh, a project that's a clinical data warehouse. And their initial pass was to use LOINC as the harmonization tool, if you will. 
as I proved to them in under an hour that it will not work because there is no rhyme or reason to how many of their LOINC for their lab results are mapped. So I am all in on this. Uh, I would like to see it separate from the policing construct that we as a collective have referred to many times and Andrea mentioned in her comments. Um, most of the LOINC that have been mapped at Ascension have been mapped by non-lab personnel. So they are ignorant of the analyzer that's being used, of the method that's used on the analyzer, of which specimen can be performed by the lab on that analyzer, meaning perhaps the analyzer can perform it on more specimens, but the lab has not done the work to support that. There, there really needs to be a laboratory in construct to the certification. Uh, I, I've grown weary of hearing that I've worked with Cerner PathNet for 20 years. I know how to implement LOINC. Well, no, you don't. You're a software engineer. <laughs> and can you tell me the difference between these three LOINC terms? And they can't. Uh, so I am on board. I would be completely willing to participate in the vision for it or anything else on a volunteer basis. Uh, so count me in. Thank you so much. Um, Tiffany, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say, I definitely yeah, agree. I know. <laughs> Oops, uh, I definitely agree with um, Andrea's idea of having focus areas. Um, so right now I really kind of oversee all the linking for my organization's lab testing. And um, I pull in, are you able to hear me? Yes, no? you muted for a moment, but there you okay. are. Yeah, I saw the, I saw the box pop up. That was strange. Um, so uh, as far as you know, partnering with people in the laboratory to kind of have them give me a final okay on a LOINC code, it's difficult because they don't, they don't really understand. So I do my best to kind of like give them a brief overview and get them up to speed and, you know, try to get them on the same page where they can okay things, but it would be great to have some targeted approaches from, um, from Regan Streif that I could share with them and say, hey, you know, this is what you really need to know in order to be able to do this. Um, and I would also say that now, so I used to work in the laboratory, which is where I got involved with LOINC and I've since moved into an IT position and I'm still kind of owning these things. And I think it would be, uh, beneficial, you know, in regards to having those specialized targeted trainings for people in the sections in the laboratory, but also maybe for IT to kind of let people know. Um, yes, you may be involved, but like, here's where your limitations are and you really need to make sure that you have lab input on certain things. Um, make sure that people are getting the correct, you know, really the experts involved. Um, and then my last comment is I am so on board for all of the, you know, having some kind of certification because I just went through um, like a big to do with my organization and why are you the person mapping the codes? Why should we trust you? Why should, you know, because I don't have anything to say, hey, here's this piece of paper that says I know what I'm doing. Um, so I'm, I'm sure I probably am not the only person to end up in that situation. So it would be really beneficial to have something like that. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, we do have a couple more hands raised, but I wanna take a moment and grab some comments and questions from our audience. Um, so uh, we have a couple of comments. Education certification should be broken into subgroups, clinical laboratory radiology. Um, and then another comment, uh, even without certification, online training would be great. So just more support. Um, but the questions then are, um, what would certification involve? And obviously that's a deep question. That's something we can start to think about. Um, do we want to take a moment to talk about that one? 
So um, April, I, I want to turn that over to Pam first before we mm -hmm. do that. Um, Pam, any comments? I have a couple before we move forward. Pam, are you still there? Hmm. I went, maybe we've lost Pam. Yeah. Okay. You haven't lost oh. me. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Oh, there yeah, you are. Like <laughs> <laughs> when it goes into presentation lose. mode, everything changes. Yes. Um, so um, I have loved all the comments so far. Uh, I have no expectations whatsoever on what things would happen from here. I intended this, uh, and I was very grateful for Marjorie to let it be on the combined agenda so that everyone could hear it um, and plant a seed to start the brainstorming. Okay. Yeah, wait, April, wait, one, one second. Um, so what I, I think what I heard you know, just in terms, of, so your slide is pros and cons, correct, Pam? And, you know, I, I, there's sort of a, a resounding pro and there are some cons, which I think um, Dan raised as it relates to the administrative and operational approach to moving forward with this. Um, and, and back to the pros, I'm, I'm hearing the major issues relate to context of use and subject matter expertise, which is um, really important if we move forward with mapping. So for that reason, um, we're hearing support for mapping certification, but there's a lot more to discuss. <clears throat> and from there, I think, Pam, if you're open to it, and April, if we have time, you said there was there were two other questions. And if you could repeat those again, I'd appreciate it. I just wanted Absolutely. to summarize where we were. Yes, um, and I agree. The general consensus is that there are many more pros, but lots to consider and think about as we move through this. Um, so these questions really do relate to those things we might need to consider as okay. we um, kind of take the next steps. Um, so one of those, and again, these aren't questions we're gonna to answer today, but just to start the, um, the brain's thinking, would you require certification for all types of LOINC codes? That's something that- um, Yeah, I think, I think these are, maybe you, what you, you could do, uh, April, is read off the items for consideration because that's gonna take a much longer discussion than we have today. Yes. You know, there are pros and cons. So or if there are others, if you could read those, that would be great. Um, no, these are all deeper dive questions. Um, more positivity, I would be happy to assist. That's from Tiffany. Um, so as far as the questions go, they're, they're certainly um, more in the execution, the implementation side of things, not necessarily should we or should we not. Okay. All right. Uh, but we do have David with his hand raised. Oh, yes, hi. Um, so I really have to echo, again, what everyone's saying. I think it's a great idea to have some sort of certification. And the reason I say that, it's almost been too easy to search for a long term. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean to put down how easy we make it, but you can go on there and put something in the search bar and hit return and you get this long list. And you don't need to go and look at any materials. You just kind of look through it and, and you know, going back, I can't believe it's been 26 years, but when we did that, that initial study looking, comparing link mapping between two large hospitals, when there were fewer than 6,000 codes in existence at the time, we found a number of, you know, mapping discrepancies for the same test. And those are the same kinds of issues that exist today, but compounded by the fact that the number of tests is grown by, you know, uh, you know, so, you know, so much, as much as it has. So, you know, I think it, many of those problems that we first found, you know, there was no material, no educational material at the time, mm -hmm. you know, would be solved if, if mappers were made aware of the, of the content within the existing material. So it may be, the certification may be, you know, at least one level be relatively simple in the fact that we have the material already. 
of course, implementing that, you know, as, as Dan expressed, would probably be more complicated and involve a little more than, you know, than just as simple as just read this. But I think some of it would be solved by that. And that would also, I think, fix some of the issues surrounding the, you know, the, the CAP um, study that was brought up. Because um, many of those discrepancies, I think, would be solved by the material in the user's guide. So, you know, maybe some of this is not as hard to fix as we think, but I think I agree we definitely should move forward, so. Yeah, David, I I agree. Uh, you know, these are, these issues are not unique to NOIC, right? So understanding context of use and having subject matter experts or expertise are sort of the two primary issues when you begin to map or interpret maps. So I, I think, um, you know, uh, you know, I just wanted to roll that up a bit. Uh, you know, I think it was Sue who mentioned she's certified in, in SNOMED. Um, there are people that are certified in uh, mapping CPT, but in that case, you, you know, the context of use is important. Um, are you mapping for reimbursement or are you mapping for documentation? Those are two different, very different things. And unless people understand, uh, you know, those distinctions, then you can misinterpret uh, mappings. Um, and that isn't always helpful. So uh, Pam, I'll, I'll ask you again, are there, you know, I think this is a great discussion for us, you know, to continue, um, uh, not necessarily here, but it's, it's good uh, information to bring internally to LOINC and consider what we do next. And Pam, what, do you have any other input? Not this time. I really appreciate sure. having the floor be opened and uh, get some opinions from from our industry, from our corner. Thanks, okay. Marjorie. You're welcome. So, so did you you have your hand up? Sorry, Marjorie. Oh, so did sorry. you want to say something? Sorry, yeah. get off mute. Um, yes, I just want to offer um, some of my experiences to the team when you start getting into this. Um, I was part of the setup and um, design and rollout of the HL7 version 2 messaging certification program and testing and training. And I'm happy to uh, offer the team, you know, my experiences, what worked, what didn't work, what we thought would work, and we were sadly disappointed in what we had no clue about that turned out to be great. Okay. That's, uh, you know, that's very helpful. Any other questions? I guess I should, if I'm looking at the latest Q&A. April, do you have any other hands raised? Uh, no, I do not see any other raised hands. And, um, that should cover all of the high level aspects of this. Okay, that's great. So um, moving on to, are we ready to move on to the UMLS review? I believe we are. Okay, David, it's over to you. Okay, great. Um, this is really quick. Uh, it's just really a um, caveat. Uh, let me just get my screen up for a moment. Uh, Oh, uh, uh, Pam, could you stop sharing, please, so I can take the screen? Thank you. Okay. Um, are you seeing my screen? Uh, the slide on my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. It doesn't. It's not outlined in green like it usually is. So I'm, I'm not sure. I wasn't wasn't able to tell. Okay. So um, this really. Or, arises, it's a little difficult when you're on the LOINC team, you know, you don't get your LOINC information from UMLS. So, you know, we don't go there and see what's on UMLS for LOINC, but then we do get questions from users about LOINC content. And sometimes, you know, it's LOINC content that they're getting from UMLS. So they have questions about that. And, you know, all I can say, just a brief kind of caveat or caution or I don't I don't know just note please note that um, there may be some differences 
between the representation of LOINC that you get, say, from the uh, UTS browser um, or the BioPortal link as well, um, that were kind of brought up, brought to our attention by users having questions. You know, when you go to the UTS browser and you look up LOINC, under that you see two things called one called LOINC parts and one called LOINC class types. And, you know, they look very similar under each of those. And it turns out that the thing labeled the node that's labeled doing parts actually is the multi-axial hierarchy, which is not, it's not labeled as such. So uh, it took us just some, you know, determining, <laughs> figuring, scanning, browsing to figure out that that's what it actually represents. Um, you know, and when you go through the browser, you see other content as you drill down that doesn't seem to be from Loink. So I think it's, it's just a, sort of like a byproduct of the way that the UMLS links synonymous names from different sources. But we're, but from the LOINC's perspective, we didn't really understand it. So there may be some things in there that, you know, you and, you know, looking at the BioPortal link um, in the slide, you know, there may be some differences that, you know, in LOINC codes you find under those two nodes um, in the BioPortal browser as well, as far as what LOINC codes are actually listed under those. So, you know, we haven't done a full evaluation and we don't really fully understand how LOINC is represented in UMLS. So with all that being said, you know, all the LOINC content is always available directly from LOINC.org. And that is the way that uh, we would recommend obtaining LOINC content um, when you're not necessarily needing to see LOINC content in the context of other things in UMLS. So that's really all I had to say. Um, regarding the UMLS representation for, for now. Um, I would say we have some ongoing, you know, probing to do just to understand it better ourselves. Um, okay, that's it for, for the UMLS topic. So I will stop sharing. Yeah, but, uh, your name was listed. Did you have any other comments as well? Or was that, that it? I do not. Okay. Thanks, David. Okay. Any questions? Marjorie, this is John Snyder. Could I jump in for one second? Certainly. Um, one item that I do want to make people aware of is that the UMLS is on different release cycles from LOINC. So UMLS is on a May-November release schedule where LOINC is on a June-December. So there is going to be some lag between the two releases to be aware of. Um, so like David said, I support using the link content from the link website um, as that would be the most current version so that you don't get caught in a release discrepancy. Um, the second question I have for David is, uh, has any of this feedback come back to National Library of Medicine? John, yeah, oh yes. Um, so we've, there, there has been communication with the National Library of Medicine. Um, regarding this and so there there are you know emails back and forth in some detail um so you know yes we do have an open communication um, okay great thank you mm -hmm. dan go ahead yeah uh david thanks for this i was going to mention two things i i don't know if you said it or not but just for folks awareness right bio portal that rendering comes from the umls representation so it's like another mm -hmm. way to get at it um, I, I wanted to mention also, um, maybe two years ago, a year ago, UMLS or NLM had a RFI um, about kind of rethinking or imagining the future state of UMLS. And uh, one of the specific things that I made comments about and would encourage others to submit their feedback on was uh, around this collaboration between the sort of source SDOs and the, um, the NLM team that curates the UMLS. I think what you brought up is a really good example of that. Um, there wasn't, you know, historically, there hasn't been a very tight kind of connection between um, those two groups. It's kind of like MLM team is kind of doing their thing, long team is kind of doing their thing. And in particular, this idea about feedback um, between different user communities kind of making it to the right place, I think, is a really important element uh, of that. So uh, I'm excited, you know, that you're having this conversation and uh, hope to see uh, good things come of it. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. And I think there was one question from Rob, right? Yep, Rob has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, well, question. Yeah, it's probably more question than comment. So, uh, yeah, I was actually just looking because I hadn't looked recently at the bioportal representation of LOINC. 
And so I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that it's driven by the UMLS representation because it looks like BioPortal is using OWL and it might be using the OWL files. Um, but I think what this highlights, you know, to some degree, you're never gonna have a perfect harmonized aligned approach to, um, well, to anything, <laughs> but um, perhaps, uh, you know, there's one of those, uh, you know, there's some benefits and there's some drawbacks towards others looking at our content and representing it in their way. I think certainly the takeaway to the extent that we have to promote this, that the, um, the official view of LOINC is available from, from the LOINC website is, is something that we really do need to promote. And then I think it does, it would be interesting to make sure that we have a persistent open dialogue with these other sites to find out what their feedback is from their users in order to better understand how we might improve what they're getting. But I don't think that given all the things that we have to do, we have to put a bunch of effort into trying to make sure that everybody shows the same thing. Okay, thank, thank you, Rob, for that comment. I, I agree, um, we don't really have the, you know, the bandwidth to go in and, and do a, an evaluation of the, of the differences. We, but we do want to be sure that the content is complete. Um, and, and that's one, one concern that we, we, we have that everything that we publish is actually in there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, right now, I don't think we, we can say one way or another whether that's not the case. And I think probably it is the case, but there've been some questions brought up because of not finding things in where we would expect. So we just want to be sure that, that everything's there. Okay, any other comments or discussion? All right, so I think um, that's it for the content items. Uh, April and Jennifer, I think the next two items are yours, the uh, fall conference, and then we'll talk about committee and subcommittee structure. Yes, that is correct. And I will share my screen if I can find my correct, there we go. Okay, so does everybody see my lovely, well, not my lovely slide, that would be Tim's creation there. Um, just as a reminder, we are planning for our next conference to be in person. We hope to see as many people there as possible. Um, we will continue to post details on our website as they unfold. But as of right now, certainly the goal is to meet everyone in France. This is hosted by Biomuro at I'm going to get this wrong, so Xavier, you can jump in and help me out. Les Pensiers for Global Health. I think I got that right. So um, everybody stay tuned for that. Mark your calendars. It will be 8th to 10th of November in France. Okay. Moving on, we wanted to refresh um, everybody's information about our link committees. We've had a few changes to how we communicate with those committees. And we just wanted to take a few minutes to make sure everyone knew what they were, what their purpose was, and how we communicate with them. So the communities, com committees, apologies, overall are intended to serve as an advisory board. They help discuss concepts and when appropriate, provide input in how the LOINC team develops their terminology. They're all volunteers from various industries, including academia and government. If you would like to join, you can submit an application from our website. Uh, you must have a direct material interest in LOINC. You should be willing to be an active participant and engage in all of the conversation. Uh, you should have a demonstrated commitment to LOINC. You can do this by having attended three prior meetings such as this or engage, and engaging in discussion, submitting term requests over the last three years or otherwise having made an, a substantive contribution to the LOINC standard. And then we also have a committee letter of agreement that you would need to sign. If you have any questions, the email is populated down there. 
And we certainly welcome anyone to submit an application to join any of our committees. Logically, the next question would be, what are those committees? We have three mains and two subcommittees. Our main committees are clinical, laboratory, and LOINC, RADLEX. And underneath clinical, we also have document ontology and nursing. You can find those at loinc.org slash committee. Each of these committees has its own dedicated website page. You can find information about the next meeting, list of members, and other details that are pertinent to that particular committee. A note about messaging. We previously had various ways to communicate with our committee members. This was just grown as each committee evolved from however it started. We have since changed that so that all of the messaging comes from one particular message um, system that we use. So you will receive your meeting reminders by email. This does not include an invitation, it's a meeting reminder. So we encourage all of our committee members and proxies to create your own invitation on your Outlook or calendar of choice with a recurrence according to that particular committee. You can also find information on the individual committee website pages as appropriate. There are open committees that would be document ontology and nursing. All of the information is there. You can visit those individual pages, which I'll list in just a moment. Uh, any attendees for those who are not committee members, they will not be on the email list. You will need to go visit that website page to get the meeting details. Uh, we, as a reminder, you'll get a message reminding you about the meeting, but not an invitation. We've had some confusion about that, so I want to be very clear. It's not an invitation. You will create that on your own calendar. So diving in very quickly to each of our committees, we have clinical, whose focus is LOINC content representing observations, measures, documents made on patients, populations, devices, and other units of analysis. Our wonderful chairs there are Stan Huff and Ted Klein, from whom you've heard already today, and you'll receive updates later this week as we get into that specific committee meeting. They do not have recurring meetings scheduled. We have discussed bringing those up, but we haven't at this point discovered a need to have recurring meetings. So at this point, we have open meetings at our link conferences. Anyone is welcome to attend, but of course, to have voting privileges and discuss certain topics, you would need to be a member. The email address is there, it's clinicalcommittee at link.org. You'll see a pattern as we go through these. And the website page is link.org committee clinical. Underneath clinical, we have document ontology. Their goal is to review potential new axes values for link document ontology. Our newly appointed chair is Rob McClure, and they have open monthly meetings for any committee members and any attendees. They also provide updates at our conferences. You'll hear one of those coming up um, later this week, I believe. Again, document ontology at link.org, and you follow the website address where you'll find all of the information about our meetings, the agendas, all of that. We also have nursing. Obviously, nursing-related clinical informatics. Lisa Anderson and Susan Matney are the chairs. They also have open monthly meetings for committee members and any attendees. You can grab that information again from the website. They will also provide information, uh, updates at our conferences later this week. Nursing, again, following the pattern here. It's a standard, we do things very organized. Another main committee is the laboratory committee. They focus on like, content representing observations, measures, and document made on specimens. So this, that's obviously the difference between clinical Pam Banning, from whom you've recently heard, is the chair, and she does a wonderful job. They have private monthly meetings for committee members. So because these are private, if you would like to join the committee, then you would need to submit um, an application for that. They do have um, open meetings at our link conferences. Any attendees are welcome to join those. Website and email address there. We also have recently brought back the RADLEX committee, whose focus is 
the development, use, and modification of the LOINC RSNA radiology playbook. The chairs are Swapna Biancar and Ken Wang. We have not at this point set up a regular meeting occurrence, but they would be private once we do get those established. Uh, we've had one meeting. We are figuring out how that's going to move forward and developing that sort of as we go. Um, but they will have an update, a uh, very brief update uh, later this week. And again, Loink Radlex at Loink, and there's the website address there. And that is my very brief committee refresh. Does anybody have any questions on what I've presented or what um, has come up in any of the um, meeting topics so far? So, um, April, if there are no questions, and please interrupt me if there are, I just thought I would summarize um, the, you know, the, the content part of the, the meeting. Um, but I would certainly defer to those who have questions at the moment. I do not see any questions coming in. Okay, so I want to make sure we, you know, have some points to walk away with and summarize the um, the great uh, discussions that we've been having. I think um, related to the long term requests uh, for person names, the um, <clears throat> next issue is to really move some of the open issues to HL7 to help us sort through the remaining issues. Um, we heard that we will move forward. Well, we sh that mapping certification is a good thing. We don't know if we'll move forward yet, um, but overall um, that was a resounding yes. I think um, with respect to uh, the UMLS review, what we heard was that um, <clears throat> you know, things will be different. The representations will be different. And as I think Rob described, it will never, things will never be the same, will never be equal. Um, I'm really putting that in sort of a, a different kind of parlance here. Uh, but I think the point that we wanna drive home is if they're different, they should be complete. And we will do some more investigation on what the differences are. And, um, I think that was it. There's the fall conference that's coming up in uh, November and um, April. Appreciate the great summary of the committee and subcommittee structure. Excellent. Any other uh, one? Is, nope. Nope. I was I any either. Okay. Go ahead, April. No, I was going to ask if there were any other questions, which I think was the same thing you were going to ask. <laughs> right. So. Um, okay. Well, um, so we got done early, which is fantastic. I think we can all take a nice long lunch break. And I welcome everyone to join us um, for either our introduction to LOINC or advanced LOINC concepts, which are um, our next sessions. They'll be presented by our amazing LOINC team. And wherever you fall on the spectrum of knowing LOINC, I'm sure you'll learn something from either one of those. Thank you.